So on January 17th, 2021, I experienced the word of the Lord coming to me and asking me to resign from the vocation of pastoral ministry. At that time, in January of 2021, I had been a credentialed pastor in the Church of the Nazarene for 16 years. So my last day as a credentialed minister was February 28th, 2021. And over the last year and a half, the Lord has been discipling me, and I've been coming to understand slowly why I had to leave the vocation of pastor and what the Lord intends next. Perhaps you share with me a common sense that the season of God's mercy, particularly on the nations of the West and who have been influenced by the West, is at its end. And a season of judgment is following upon both the church and the nations of the earth. This message has been heavy on me since at least 2016, when I was pastoring outside of Concord, New Hampshire. And it probably reached a fever pitch uh, for me personally just before um, the COVID pandemic began in March of 2020. But it's continued through 2020 and into 2021. At the time of my resignation, I was in the midst of declaring a call to repentance for the church, which I still believe I did in obedience to Jesus. And that call can be found in a message entitled, Have You Offended God? And as I've continued on this journey out of ministry and into discipleship to Jesus, I gave another message in August of 2021. That one was entitled, Signing Off. In that message, and it was very new to me when I recorded it, I tried to explain the work that the Lord has been doing and showing me that the call to ministry I had followed and the ambition that I was still cultivating to accomplish something meaningful and lasting for God were idols. They were infested with false spirits calling me and maybe others like me to service and to significance, but somehow to follow that in a way that was not the way of Jesus. And yet, though at that time, in that message, I communicated that I felt the Lord was asking me to step back from preaching and from my attempts to build a ministry platform on social media. So the Lord has seemed over this last year to give me intermittent assignments, which required me to remain engaged in ways I thought were to be left behind me. And so I continued on a much slower pace, but still to release several videos. And then I felt uh, the Lord asking me to produce a series of messages revealing to his people the true nature of his judgment on the world. And the result was a podcast series entitled The Gods of the West, which I did in November and December and into January. So November, December 2021 into January of 2022. It may, may have even extended into February. I don't remember. Then near the end of 2021, when I was in the midst of doing the Gods of the West series, I was asked to serve as an interim minister of the church I was attending. And I knew that that assignment was also of the Lord after prayer and some other things. So I accepted. And since February of 2022, I've been preaching again every week. So despite having signed off in August of 2021, the Lord has not yet released me to step away fully. And I've come to understand this delay in my departure from this more public online thing as the mercy of God. Still God's people have not repented, at least not entirely. And still God is making his appeal. And not only through me, certainly through others similarly commissioned. I expect that my commitment to signing off was personally necessary in August of 2021, but the actual finality of it is still yet in the future, though that future I think is, is much closer now uh, than it was a year ago, and I'm preparing for it, and when God wills it, I'll obey. In recent days, like in this past spring and even into this summer, the intensity of God's appeals have been increasing. On April 22nd, the word of the Lord came to me and instructed me to warn his people that the church was, in fact, the harlot of revelation. So I did that. Then on May 27th, the word of the Lord came to me, assigning me to contrast the teachings of the Ten Commandments and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount with the institutional, ritual, and ethical practices of the Christian churches. 
That I did in a message entitled, The Calling Out of the Church. And then on May 31st, I experienced the word of the Lord coming to me again, assigning me to communicate his will to his followers that it's now time to leave the institutional churches. Uh, maybe not with our bodies so much as with our hearts and our minds. And I obeyed in a message entitled, It's Time to Go. Now this prog progression has been so slow and steady for me that it all makes sense to me. But perhaps for some who've been following the ministry, uh, it's left you com confused or perplexed. It's true to my experience to say that what I'm saying is what I feel I'm being told to say. But that is a subjective experience for me, and you have to discern the spirits yourself, and you may come to believe that that's not what in fact is happening, and time will tell, All right? Time will tell. I don't believe that God's judgment is coming on the Christian church simply because it's an institution. Institutions are inevitable. There's no problem with institutions as a category. I mean, any kind of organized group will institutionalize to some degree. But what I am convinced of is that God's judgment is coming on the Christian church, which can be evidenced in so many ways in our culture because it has institutionally aligned itself with the spirits in rebellion against God. The ideologies, the mechanisms by which leadership is done, even leaders are chosen, seems to me to be more akin to the spirits of this world than to anything we might find in the scriptures, for instance. Jesus' kingdom is not of this earth. We find that in John 18, 36. Nor is it to be built the way earthly kingdoms are built. We find Jesus teaching his disciples as much in Luke 22, 25 through 27. Jesus, when he talked about discipling the nations and sending out his disciples, he didn't speak about building buildings. He didn't require that of them. Instead, the apostles spoke of the gathered community of faith, the people themselves as the temple of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus required only small gatherings. The Jew his Jewish contemporaries required 10 men, which were representative of 10 households, to form a minion and then could form a synagogue. Jesus seems to have reduced that number when he tells his disciples that when they have to make decisions about the word of God, decide what to bind and to loose, which is a rabbinic way of speaking about interpreting and applying the teachings of scripture, he said that they only needed two or three gathered for him to be with them. It reduces the minyan requirement to a degree. We find that in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. The earliest followers of Jesus, if we look at the way that they worshipped, it was very similar to synagogue worship. They incorporated study of the prophets and the apostles, um, which now we have as the first and the New Testaments, prayers, which probably are the Psalms, and table fellowship as the only components of their gatherings. Today, Christians seem to be enthralled with what the Bible would call Nephilim, often translated giants, but with people of great talent and great accomplishment. We tend to believe that the way to get the gospel into the world is to pursue excellence, to seek the most gifted and talented to worship for us and to enrapture us with their supreme efforts to honor God. It seems strange. God became, in the form of Jesus, a servant, and he said that those who wish to be great would be the least in the kingdom of heaven, and the first would be last, and the last would be first. It seems strange that we have uh, completely forsaken that in the way we think the gospel should be spread to the world. Through them, we've come to believe, through these supremely gifted people who can do things better than we can do and can get us caught into a certain uh, mood and fervor, we've come to believe that we can connect with God through them and enter into his presence. They've become almost a new priesthood, whether it's um, musical performances or um, ritual chants or sacred space or dynamic preaching, whatever it is. We think that these great ones... These Nephilim are the ones who can bring us into God's presence and connect us with him. And as far as I can tell, that's all pagan. It was to avoid this that the early church prohibited musical performances as part of Christian worship for nearly the first two centuries of the faith. Not because there's anything inherently wrong with music, but because the perception of what music is for seems to always fall back into paganism. It was also to avoid this that we've been talking about, that Paul warned the first century churches to be wary of super apostles 
who entertain the masses with their eloquent rhetoric and charismatic presentations. And perhaps most lamentable of all is the church's caricature of the gospel itself. Long forgotten is Jesus' call to deny ourselves, to take up our crosses and follow Jesus. The gospel today insists that Jesus denied himself so that we don't have to deny ourselves. In fact, we're told that we are to be who we are, to indulge ourselves, that the primary work of the church is to affirm and to encourage and to lift us up. We're told that Jesus took up his cross so that we don't have to take up crosses, that Jesus was obedient to God simply because we will never be obedient. In this gospel, Jesus fulfilled all of God's hopes for humanity in himself so that those who believe in his work don't have to please God or do his will themselves at all. Long forgotten is the promise of God delivered to the church through the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans chapter 6 verses 12 through 14, Therefore sin is not to reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the parts of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead, and your body's parts as instruments of righteousness for God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. If I'm hearing God adequately, then God's word to the church today is twofold. Matthew chapter 23 verse 15 seems to carry the gist of the first part of it. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. And the second is best summarized by Luke chapter 18 verse 22, which is part of Jesus' response to the rich young ruler, he's usually characterized, who asks, what can I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus tells him to obey the law. And he says he's done that his whole life. And then Jesus says this, this is Luke 18, 22. One thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute the money to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. The churches are being called to do this, to let go of all that we've accumulated and follow Jesus anew. So it's time to leave. It's time to abandon what we've accumulated, give it back to the world from whence it came. It's time to leave behind our legacies and our bylaws and our buildings and our savings accounts. It's time to leave Egypt and follow God into the wilderness with the scriptures alone. And I have to repent too. This is not some sort of a holier than thou message. In fact, this last year and a half has been the beginning of my repentance. Pastors like me are part of the reason the church has become irredeemably corrupted by the world. When God called me to feed his sheep, I interpreted that in a very worldly way, and I didn't want to do anything else. I wanted that to be all I did with my life. I wanted that call to be a career to which I would devote my full time. And to do that, I needed an institution to support me tithers to support that institution and on and on. I needed a kingdom on earth in order to have the future that I was pursuing and of course that I thought God was asking me to pursue. For me and so many others like me, we can't afford to repent because too much depends on the survival of the institution as it is. From Christian schools to seminaries to the contemporary Christian music industry to Christian media outlets to parachurch agencies to church hierarchies and administrative organizations and staff to clergy who are, need to retire and have pensions and to local churches. It's nearly impossible to calculate how many of us depend for our living on the survival of the church as it is. I'm coming to understand that this is why I had to forsake my calling. Because my calling was part of what is keeping the church from returning to Jesus and to the simple worship of the first believers. So I repent. I've left. And though the Lord has asked me to serve temporarily in order to make one more appeal to his people to repent, I'll soon leave for good. That is not an abandonment of the people of God. But it is an abandonment of any desire to be a leader or someone in power or somebody of influence. I'll serve God's people as long as I live. But what I am abandoning is the current way that that is being offered. 
It's simply to leave an institution which has been designed to preserve itself and to raise up disciples who will preserve it indefinitely. We owe a great debt to the institutional church. They have preserved the scriptures. They have preserved, through the testimony of many witnesses, a, a faithful life following God. But the corruption is now no longer a bug, but a feature. It's time to begin again with just the scriptures, prayer, and table fellowship with two or three gathered. And I know some are concerned there won't be enough checks and balances if we were to do that. Somebody has to be in charge of that thing, this thing. And I feel the same way in my heart, in my instincts. I was raised in this culture too. I still think that power protects. But look at where we are. And ask yourself if all of these institutional checks and balances have truly kept the church from apostasy. In an ideal world, they would. But once the corruption of the world enters into the institution and into the system, the system protects that along with everything else. This is what Martin Luther saw and tried to bring reformation to the Roman Catholic Church. It's actually, I think, what caused the great schism between East and West in the beginning, because I think the East saw that the West was beginning to hoard power and take personal responsibility for guiding the church, and they saw that to be unhealthy. And of course, they responded in kind by excommunication. And so they probably took with them the infection because of how they responded to the, the disease that they saw developing. But in any case, Luther saw the same thing, and I think many Protestants have seen the same thing and constantly are trying to bring renewal. But it's always through this institutional hoarding of power, of, of um, sort of exiling uh, foes and all that sort of thing. We have not, through our institutional checks and balances and through our traditions, we've certainly preserved the scriptures, but we have not protected ourselves from apostasy. In fact, you might say that it was the very... Um, mechanisms of tradition and institutionalism that once co-opted by foreign pagan values were the, the primary source, maybe the largest source of infecting the future and of leading future generations away from faithfulness to Jesus. But once this has happened, something, something has to occur. And the worldly way is revolution. It's trying to take over. It's trying to seize power. But the way of Jesus is simply to depart into faithful communities. Perhaps it's time to believe that God is actively involved in preserving his own truth. Maybe it's only in our arrogance that we've assumed that God needs our institutional help to protect his investment in the world. To those who have ears to hear, it's time to go. And some have asked me, what does that mean? We just abandon everything? I don't know. I don't know. The Lord is going to have to lead you. What I do know is that the real heart of our discipleship and what we really assume to be worship of God has to look something like the worship of the early apostles. Small groups gathering in their homes, attending to the teachings of the prophets and the apostles. The can canonical Christian, Christian scriptures are what we have today. And praying together and fellowshipping together. If, if we still need to go to worship services, if we still want to see some who have sacrificed for us reach retirement and all that, I mean, you're going to have to decide that with the scriptures. But we have to recognize that generally what's happening on a Sunday morning is not worship of God, at least not worship reflective of the way God asked to be worshipped. It's more reflective of how we have decided we enjoy worshiping. It reflects more of us than of his requests. And so if we do need to continue to stay, for whatever reason the Lord might keep us there, as I'm there now, we have to recognize that, that, that what we're doing there does not honor God. And we need to seek to honor him in the midst of that. And then to worship him in the way he's asked, in the simpler way. And the Lord will guide you. But it's time to depart from the idea that the church and God, the institutional church and God are one and the same or that God is pleased with what they're doing, or even that it's repairable. I, I, he's just not saying that to me. I spent all of my ministry believing that it was repairable and doing my best to try and help be a voice for that. 
But what the Lord had begun to reveal to me really first in 2016, and then it's taken me, I'm a slow learner, it's taken me a long time to accept it, is that he has no intention of saving the institutional church, but he does have every intention of being with his people when the walls fall. So my encouragement would be, if you are not currently meeting in a group of two or three who are committed to the teachings of the apostles and the prophets, pursuing God in faith in Jesus, willingness to accept the gospel claim that though the gospel and salvation is given to us freely, it comes also with a set of responsibilities that the godly will gladly embrace. Responsibilities to be ethically similar to Jesus, to submit to the teachings of the scriptures, to live out those teachings faithfully, all while forgiving their enemies and loving their enemies and learning how to be godly people in the world. Commit yourselves to that wherever you are and come out at least by joining into those groups and don't require an institutional organization to plan it and to prepare it and to endorse it and to police it and to curriculize it and all the other things that we depend on. God will meet with you. He met with the early church. And they had their fights and they had their arguments. But it was far less structured. You can tell by Paul's letters, far less structured than it is today. Paul had to argue for the truthfulness of the gospel. He couldn't enforce it. And um, God was with them. And he'll be with you too. So follow the Spirit's lead. But open your eyes, church. True followers of God, open your eyes. See the idols. See the corruption. See the way in which in our every practice of worship we have rejected the teachings of Jesus. And then become a people again who worship him in spirit and in truth.